how do you become a Buddhist? It's one of the questions that I'm asked most often in the comments to my videos, and I'll try to give you an answer coming right up. I'm Doug Smith of the Online Dharma Institute, that's onlinedharma.org, where I try to uh, teach courses on uh, early Buddhist Dharma from a contemporary perspective to help you understand what the Buddha taught. If you're new to this channel and interested in living a, a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to the channel and uh, click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. How do you become a Buddhist? Now, there are various ways to answer this question depending on which school of Buddhism most interests you. There are different kinds of, of, of perhaps ceremonies or things involved in various schools. And it also depends uh, on whether one wants to be uh, simply a lay follower, as many of us are, or if one wishes to become a monastic, which is, of course, a much more serious and life-changing kind of decision. Now, my own uh, background, my own, if you like, affiliation is as a secular practitioner, and so my own answer, that is to say the answer from my own approach, is going to be somewhat different from the answers to other schools. But I'm going to try to give you a general answer because I know some of you are, are interested in being secular and some of you are not. Now, to begin with, certainly lay people of whatever background are free to attend uh, virtually any uh, Buddhist uh, meditation or service or chant or whatever that you find in your local temple. And now, of course, if you have a question, you can always ask. Sometimes there are, uh, let's say, initiation periods or uh, like a little class that they'll give you for an hour for, for newbies. Uh, who don't really know, let's say, how to behave properly within the Zendo, if it happens that you're interested in Zen. Because there are certain kinds of, uh, of ways you're supposed to behave once you enter the, the, uh, the actual meditation room. You're supposed to hold your hands in certain ways. You're supposed to bow before you enter, and those kinds of things. And simple things like that they'll generally give to, to new practitioners. But again, this depends upon the school. Now, uh, when you go to a... Uh, a, a meditation or an event like this. As I say, any layperson is welcome to be there, and in general they're going to involve things uh, like chants, uh, again, depending on the particular school that you're in. Uh, chants such as the Three Jewels, chants such as the Five Precepts, or chants such as the four bodhisattva vows. Now, these are these are typical chants of the kinds that you might find in many Buddhist centers. That they will invite everybody there to uh, to, to chant in unison, and they'll give you usually a little uh, paper thing with the chant written out on it in case you don't know it. Now, what are these chants? Um, the three jewels are the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And traditionally, Buddhists are said to take refuge in these three jewels. You take refuge in the Buddha, you take refuge in the Dharma, that is to say, the Buddha's teaching, and you take refuge in the Sangha. The Sangha being the group of monastics, or the order, or the group of people who are awakened, whatever. Um, now, the five precepts, on the other hand, are the five ethical strictures. Now, I've done a video on the five precepts. I'll put a link to it uh, down, actually down in the show notes, probably easier that way. But basically, the five precepts are not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, not to commit sexual misconduct, and not to abuse intoxicants. And many uh, Buddhist orders will uh, chant these five precepts uh, at the beginning or at some point in their service as simply a, a reminder of what these precepts are. And finally, there are the, the bodhisattva vows, which are chanted in uh, many Mahayana kinds of Buddhist centers, such as Zen centers. And these uh, are, it's translated variously depending on the center you're at, uh, but uh, one common translation that I found on the internet recently is, uh, creations are numberless, I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible, I vow to transform them. Reality is boundless, I vow to perceive it. And the awakened way is unsurpassable, and I vow to embody it. And I think it's pretty clear that this, these four bodhisattva vows have a certain paradoxical flavor to them, in the sense that they seem like things that are impossible to achieve, and yet you're vowing to achieve them. And in all of these cases, the cases of uh, the Three Jewels and the Five Precepts and these vows, there's going to be a range of interpretations of how we are to 
take to them? What do we think about them? What does it mean, for example, to, to take refuge in the Dharma or the Buddha or the Sangha? What does it mean uh, not to steal or not to kill or uh, not to uh, in abuse intoxicants? What does it mean uh, to vow these kinds of things? And this is where I think personal, our own personal background and our own personal interpretation comes in. Uh, the, the various uh, uh, teachers will have their own interpretations that they will generally give if you want them to. But in my experience, uh, most Buddhist teachers allow a, a broad range of potential interpretations. It's basically up to you to try to find uh, some kind of uh, uh, inspiration in the, in the various uh, chants that you're giving. And if you find them inspirational, then you'll find it inspirational in however you happen to do. Now, as I say, these are chants that you will generally do in a group. Uh, they're done every time that they get together, or at least very, very often, so there's nothing specific about you perhaps being a new member. You're going to just join in. If they do these kinds of chants, they don't always. Uh, not every kind of center does these kinds of chants. Uh, in, for instance, insight or vipassana centers, they do much less of this kind of thing than they do in other kinds of centers. But there may be other things involved as well. There may be other ceremonies that a particular kind of school will would like you to go through if you want to become a fully-fledged, even a lay member. And that's something that you would have to uh, research for yourself. If there's a particular school that you're interested in, you might want to uh, research them online or go to the local center and ask about these kinds of things. Because they'll, of course, they'll be very happy to tell you what's involved, if anything is involved at all. And in general, for instance, in uh, popular sort of Zen centers and so on, there, there really isn't anything else involved for a lay practitioner most of the time. Now, it goes without saying that much more is going to be involved if what you want to do is to be a monastic, if you want to ordain as a monastic. There is way too much for me to go into here, uh, especially because each school has their own uh, idea of what is involved with that. Uh, I'll put some links down below in the show notes uh, for a couple or th three different schools and some beginning, anyway, uh, background about what, what is involved in those. Uh, basically, they involve uh, a number of different rituals and uh, taking on of robes, wearing ro robes, perhaps changing your name, perhaps shaving your head, uh, and undertaking all kinds of additional uh, monastic vows. Uh, this is not the kind of thing that I think most of us are going to be interested in, but it's good to know at least that it exists, uh, even if it's simply to know what other people have gone through who are in those robes and with those shaved heads around you. But the heart of the matter, at least for me, is the resonance that we have, or don't have, with the Dharma. That is, with the essential teachings of Buddhism. That if we have that kind of uh, resonance of the heart with these kinds of teachings, that's what really matters. Uh, for example, the teaching that all things change. That we ourselves are constructs that are con continually in a process of flux. That who we were yesterday is different from who we are today and who we will be tomorrow. That there is no a perfect refuge within uh, daily life, that, that all parts of the world that surround us are to one degree or another imperfect, that they're prone to change, they're prone to decay, that good events now will cease to be good in the future and be replaced by other events, and so on. These kinds of essential uh, teachings in Buddhism are really the heart of the matter if, if it comes to becoming a Buddhist in some sense. The basic causal idea here is that we have cravings. We crave for security. We crave for permanence. We crave for uh, positive kinds of experiences in life. And these cravings can never ordinarily be satisfied. No matter what we get, we're going to crave more. And so what we find, what we come to find by doing Buddhist practices is that there are other practices we can do to try to minimize these cravings over long periods of time. That that when we do these kinds of practices, our ordinary cravings tend to diminish over time, that we become more uh, open to the change of life. We become more equanimous with the vicissitudes of change. And indeed, one of the primary things that we crave is identity, is identification. We crave our own identity. We crave our own identification with other things. So. We think about a, a team, a sports team, that we identify with, that we crave their winning a certain uh, games or popular games. 
we crave our country. We, we think of ourselves perhaps as patriots, as somebody who is on the side of right in our country and against the side of wrong, either within or outside of our country. We crave identification with our families, that we're the good family as opposed to other people, or at least we are our own family, which has its own benefits. These kinds of cravings are natural in life. They're part of uh, what keeps us attached to parts of the world and what eventually can produce sadness and disappointment when things don't go as well as we might want. And wanting to become a Buddhist is another form of craving, another form of identification, subtle identification. So I would submit that that's something also that you should investigate, that you should look into in your own lives. Try to think about uh, what is it about being a Buddhist, using that title, that name, that attracts you? Is there a way to disentangle yourself from these kinds of names, from the practices that may uh, make you feel like you're identified as a particular kind of person? As a secular practitioner, I'm more interested in the, the motion of your heart towards the ideals of the Dharma rather than towards particular labels. Uh, because uh, to me, it is the heart of the Dharma that makes the, that, that really makes the thing important, that m makes the most importance in being a Buddhist, is understanding the importance of the Dharma and the ways in which it can make our lives better. So uh, to me, it's the practice that's most important, more than anything else, and certainly more than labels. But I think it's also important to know, in case you're interested in this, about the various schools of Buddhism, to which we might identify, or at least where we might go for, uh, for help, or to, to, to try to find more about the Dharma, because there are various different approaches around us in the world today. And I did an earlier video about the three schools of Buddhism, which I'll put a link to up here on the screen. I'd recommend taking a look at that. I hope it's useful to you. Thanks so much to all my patrons over on Patreon, and many of them are named down below, and I hope we'll catch you on the next video. Meanwhile, be well.